Well, as we have already established today, as Father's Day, a day that we set aside to to honor our dads. And uh, as I was thinking about this day and and what I might bring in the way of a relevant message, I soon realized that Father's Day is very different from Mother's Day, which we celebrated in the early part of last month. Moms are, are special to us, and of course so are dads, but in a in a different way. While mom may call on another mom, more experienced mom or grandmother, or again, somebody else uh, that's an experienced mother for advice, on some level, all females seem to instinctively know how to care for a child to a degree, even at a young age. And I don't think that's the case with men. When, When I became a father, anytime my son Jake would cry, I had no idea if he was hungry or in pain or had something in his britches that he was in a bigger hurry to get rid of than I was. And as he grew older, when things didn't seem right, I I never knew if he was sick or in trouble or some little girl had broke his heart. Yet again, Dee Dee somehow always seemed to know. However, time is a teacher. And I eventually learned that when things seemed a little bit off with Jake, it was reasonably safe to assume that he was in some sort of trouble. While neither one of us had ever raised a child, I think girls are better equipped for motherhood than guys are for fatherhood. Therefore, accepting my gender-related handicap for raising children, with one exception, I suppose I always erred on the side of trying to raise my boys in a way that was similar to the way my dad raised me. So far, my dad has been my dad for 65 years and remains an integral part of my life as well as a reliable source of wisdom in many areas. Consequently, while my present day challenges, you know, don't have that much to do with raising kids anymore, I still value his opinion. When I was born, my father was already an active follower of Jesus. After serving in the army, and a short stint at working another job, I believe he worked for, for Rich's department store for a few months, he quickly settled into a decades-long career with the United States Postal Service. And when he wasn't at work or trying to figure out how to stretch a paycheck, you could usually find him serving others through the various arms of the local church we attended, leading our family in ways that might eventually foster the same kind of servanthood in, in our own lives. Self-motivated and having a steadfast track record, God blessed our family with a good provider who understood that while it may have been the fruit of his two hands that fed our family, the Heavenly Father was the actual provider of our day-to-day needs. Consequently, while we've had our run-ins over the years, I've never doubted whether my father loves me or has my best interest in mind with anything he says or does short of something linked to a silly inconsequential dust up we've had some of those and all that I've said this morning I realize that the blessing God gave me through the earthly father that he chose for me isn't everyone's story nor did I necessarily approach fatherhood in the same way or with the same priorities as he did Nonetheless, I tried to instill in my boys the same values, ethics, and practical life skills that my dad attempted to instill in me, setting an expectation that that my sons would follow in my footsteps. I'm talking about things like self-respect or respect for others or taking care of your shoes and other possessions or using a napkin when I eat barbecue ribs even if there's nobody watching. And the importance of securing reliable transportation so that I could make it to work every day on time. And he, he just didn't try to impose his way of life on me. He helped me do many of those things until I could do them on my own. Therefore, when I became a dad, in, in times when I was blessed with the means to do so, I supported my son's interests, whatever they were, always in a way or with some fatherly advice that reflected my hopes to instill the same ethics and values in them as my dad tried to instill in me. When my boys were earning enough money to consider purchasing the first car, I helped them make that young man's dream a reality. Likewise, when they brought girls and dogs home, 
Well, I tried my best to treat them like family. So again, except for one thing, all the things I tried to do and teach my sons were the things that my dad taught or did for me. What was the one thing I didn't do? Unlike my dad, while I was long sure of my own salvation, throughout much of the early years of my children's lives, I failed to raise them with the proper emphasis on knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I don't mean to say that I grew up with my dad constantly thumping the Bible when he talked to me. However, we consistently attended church, and he lived by the same principles we learned at church when we were at home. I heard him pray. I watched him teach Sunday school and spend time with teenagers, and I saw him serving others. Consequently, much of my early life was spent in an environment very conducive to eventually experiencing the gospel of Jesus Christ for myself. Now, with all the things I've said, it's not wrong to, to take these steps to, to practically prepare a child for the coming challenges of living life in a very complicated and corrupt world, because that's what dads do. But we can do that to a point that fosters a false reliance on one's efforts and savviness rather than a reliance on God. Like myself, I think many Christian fathers who receive salvation early in their lives begin fatherhood as baby Christians who only begin to truly follow Jesus after experiencing the stress associated with the reality and challenges of living life in a fallen world. And that stress only multiplies when they see their children grow up into the world and begin to experience some of that same stress themselves. Fortunately, I eventually found my way back to living some semblance of the life that my dad wanted me to live. With my eventual return to, to life living according to God's truth and knowing what I know now, perhaps the Lord has given me a keener than ever awareness that many men and women grow up without the benefit of an earthly father, stepfather, or some other flavor of a father figure, godly or otherwise. And that may be due to a, a, an untimely death or divorce, or perhaps there are some here or listening who may not even know who their birth father is. Given that reality, perhaps you woke up this morning on Father's Day feeling cheated. Considering that possibility, it would be unintentionally negligent of me to stand up here and deliver a Father's Day message that assumes you've been blessed in the same way that I have. Likewise, even for those blessed with a godly father figure, many can only celebrate the secular version of this day through memories, which is a bridge I haven't crossed yet. Therefore, on this day that we set aside to honor the fathers in our lives, rather than talking about things that I don't know anything about, we're only going to talk about things we can learn concerning fatherhood in Scripture and how we can become better fathers in whatever flavor that might look like. In addition, before we leave, I also want to consider the impact that godly men can make in the lives of others through embracing the role of a stand-in spiritual father. So, whether you have a good relationship with your earthly father or you don't even know who he is, the first point of today's message is, is that you, me, and everyone else who believes in Jesus can have a great relationship with our Heavenly Father, giving us good reason to celebrate this day. If we look to God's Word, we can see that regardless of what life tossed your way in the way of an earthly dad, through a Christ-enabled relationship with our Heavenly Father, we all have the best Father of all. Amen? Furthermore, through that relationship, we also have a father whose perfect character and truth teach us how to be good fathers ourselves, whether we have a good earthly example or not. And finally, having been adopted into the family of God and offered the opportunity to grow in his grace and knowledge, God may very well call us into a spiritual mentorship of one who is fatherless in terms of spiritually based guidance. So whether your father is one who is everything that is described in a Hallmark Father's Day greeting card or you're a Heinz 57 of unknown ingredients 
All believers have a father worth of celebration, for God is our heavenly father, the most loving and caring father of all, making him worthy of any honor we could possibly bestow on this or any other day. Considering that declaration that I've just made, one might ask, Pastor Chris, I know we call him, that's God, our father, but in what way is God our father? If someone had asked me, to explain that a few days ago, I'm not sure that I could have provided you with any off-the-cuff answers that would adequately give you a true sense of God's position as a father to all who are spiritually adopted into his family through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That said, it's essential to be, ad to be able to answer such questions by citing Scripture and explaining the reality concerning God the Father with words that go beyond some mysterious spiritual lingo and instead reflect the true intimacy of God as a Father who embraces us as His children and perfectly loves us as His own. As his own. So, what did I come up with this week? Through a letter primarily written to Gentile believers living in Rome, the Apostle Paul provides the Bible with a book of systematic theology explaining the central aspects of faith in Jesus in a logical order with well-thought-out reasoning. That's the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, a section of the letter that centers on living our new life in Christ through the indwelling Holy Spirit, Paul writes the following, beginning in verse 14. He says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you can live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're God's children, then we are his heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. So I want you to hold on to that word, Abba, that's highlighted on our scripture slide, while we read some additional scripture. Jesus uses this same word as he passionately prays in the hours just before his crucifixion. The record of this prayer found in, in Mark 14 Reads this way, Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Finally, in chapter 4 of his letter to the Galatians, Paul explains that God sends his son spirit to live in the hearts of every one of his adopted sons and daughters. In, in Galatians 4, 6, he writes, and because we are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. So we see that both Paul and Jesus use the word Abba in reference to God, which happens to be the Aramaic equivalent of the words Daddy or Papa. In regions surrounding 21st century Jerusalem, children still call their, their fathers Abba. Think about that. When a child is first learning to talk, some of the first recognizable words they speak are usually mama or dada because these words are relatively easy to say. Abba. Abba. Certainly we're touched when we think of God the Father as Abba or Daddy because that name implies such personal intimacy. However, when we think of God this way, we, we've got to be careful to not do so in a way that reduces God's glory as the master of the universe and creator of all created things. What else does the Bible say about God as our father? As I look to answer that question this week, surprisingly enough, the Old Testament says very little. And according to Reverend Google, he only refers to God as father 15 times in the Old Testament. Why? Why? I was hoping one of y'all knew. Well, I'm not exactly sure why, but the writers of the Old Testament seem to place a greater emphasis on the differences between humans and God, almost always revealing God as separate and beyond us in every way. 
Therefore, in the manner in which the Old Testament writers reveal God's overwhelming power and perfection, he is seen in, in what we might say is a way that is less than intimate and close to us. What about the New Testament? In the New Testament, although God conceptually remains holy, meaning he's set apart and majestic, Jesus has this strikingly clear emphasis on God as Father, both his Father and our Father as well. We see that in Jesus' response to Mary Magdalene, who, who suddenly realizes that the person speaking to her just outside Jesus' empty tomb is the risen Christ himself. As she lingers in astonishment, the risen Jesus says, Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. With these scriptures concerning God as our Father in mind, it's also Jesus who teaches us to pray to God as our Father. In Matthew 6, 9, Jesus instructs us to pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Likewise, as we saw in Galatians 4, verse 6, it's the Spirit of the Son who leads us into intimacy with God as our Abba Father. Uh, again, that verse says, And because we are his children, God sent, his, sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, I'm a father. And of course, in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, Jesus utters his famous words connecting God's love with the, with the love of an earthly parent. Uh, beginning in verse 7, Jesus declares, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? In addition, Hebrews 12, 9 through 11 tells us that as a loving father who wants the best for his children, God will lovingly discipline us when necessary. Beginning in, in verse 9, the human author of Hebrews, presumably the apostle Paul, writes, We have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Finally, the parable of the lost son found in Luke chapter 15, which you can go home and read for yourself, tells us that as our Father, God receives us, He forgives us, and rejoices over us when we repent and return home to Him. So with all the scripture we've read this morning, we can conclusively determine that God the Father, God the Father, has made Himself God our Father, which means He's intimately, emotionally, and sacrificially involved in our lives. With that, I think you'll agree that He isn't like a Father, He is our Father. Therefore, God's greatest glory, his greatest glory, is, is that the one who is separate and far beyond us, who created all things and needs nothing from any of us, chose to become our father, lovingly adopting us as his own children. Amen. And with that, all of us have someone to celebrate on Father's Day. So now that we've established some rhyme and reason why all believers can celebrate this day, I want to shift our attention to determining what a good earthly father looks like. And we're going to start that, or we're going to do that by looking at three fatherly characteristics demonstrated by the greatest father of all. Number one, great fathers love unconditionally. No matter what you do, no matter how many times you do it, nothing can take God's love away from you. 
He loves you whether you came in this morning as his child through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or if you came here today as a condemned sinner bound for hell. The bottom line is that God loves you and nothing can change that. However, like our relationship with our earthly father, we can lose fellowship with God. Nonetheless, his love always remains and that's how we should be with our own children. They need to know that our love for them is unconditional. Number two, great fathers put their children first. On the other hand, sometimes not so great fathers get their priorities messed up. And that said, some dads only want to be dads when it's convenient, and some decide that they really don't want to be dads at all. Why? Well, when you become a parent, if you do it God's way, You'll no doubt experience days when it seems you no longer have a life of your own because regardless of your plans and desires, a father's life necessarily revolves around your child and it will do so for quite some time. Consequently, rather than fatherhood, some men choose to follow their selfish desires, which they see as good reasons to shirk their responsibilities. And while I think that's very sad, this is explainable. These selfish desires are born of a sinful flesh nature that, that blinds many men to the blessing that comes through children. Indeed, you know, we can all be overwhelmed by the prospect of being someone's father, but I think it helps when you think of Jesus, who was always putting the needs of others before his own. And finally, number three, great fathers look out for their children's future. Many parents... I saw this when I spent 11 years working at a Christian school. Many parents plan and save for their child's education. We attempt to lead and guide our children in making the right decisions. And, and while we should be concerned with those things, godly fathers should be more concerned with their children's eternal future. When measured against eternity, our time here on earth is, is, is quite short. Therefore, godly fathers should ensure that we consistently set the right example that accounts for the spiritual life that we will continue to live long after we end up on the wrong side of the dirt. While most, I think, would agree with what I've said in word and principle, we can't just take our children to church expecting others to show them how to have a relationship with God. Instead, we should be living that kind of relationship in front of them. God's desire is for everyone to be able to call him Abba Father. Therefore, God is patient. Second uh, Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord really isn't being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So here we see that a godly father is also patient. Like God, his number one desire for his children is that they have this personal relationship with him, God the Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So these are just a few examples that God's character provides for fathers of any flavor. What about children, men, and women who don't enjoy the benefits of having a fatherly man in their lives? Before we leave, and with that question in mind, also considering that most men in this church are beyond the age when we typically think about what God says as it relates to earthly fatherhood, I'd like to wind up with some words that I hope will adequately express the world's need for seasoned spiritual fathers willing to step in to a fatherly role in the lives of those spiritually younger than themselves who may be in desperate need of guidance. In 1979, Palainsburg, South Africa was set aside as a National Wildlife Reserve. Shortly after that, more than 6,000 animals were introduced to the reserve in the largest wildlife relocation ever. This mix of animals included a group of juvenile male orphan elephants chosen because they were relatively small and therefore they were easier and less costly to relocate. This relocation also included two adult female circus elephants that were to be reintroduced into the wild. Fourteen years later, park rangers began to notice that the male elephants, by, by this time, 
where six-ton teenagers in the middle of the elephant version of puberty were showing aggressive behavior. They swaggered around bullying the females and practicing their lover boy skills while fighting among themselves sometimes to the death. In the following year, park personnel also found more than 50 rhinos with their horns ripped out, their backs broken, and their bodies mutilated, immediately suspecting that the gruesome murder spree was the work of these out-of-control elephant hoodlums. Fearing an imminent attack on park visitors, officials were desperate to reestablish law and order in the herd, preferring to do so through a natural means if possible. So at the suggestion of an ecologist named Gus Van Dyke, six fully matured male elephants from another reserve were introduced into the herd. Guess what happened? Within weeks, after some less than gentle discipline from the older males, the attacks on the rhinos and the aggressive behavior towards the other elephants ended. So without a template of, of proper social behavior, these young elephants were at the mercy of their rampaging desires, which put them at as much risk as it did anyone else. Now, while we can learn much from this elephant story concerning the value of having a, a father figure in our lives, as born-again believers in Jesus, our concerns for the fatherless must extend beyond social boundaries or setting social boundaries to include guidance of a spiritual nature. In the absence of one of these godly flavors of godly fathers who bears responsibility, I'm sorry, who bears responsibility for the spiritual well-being of our little brothers and sisters in Christ? Who ensures that when they reach their full potential and the things they can do for God through a relationship with Jesus Christ? Who ensures that they do that? Well, I can't fully answer those questions, especially in the time we have left. I can confidently say that the task should start with the men of the church, with the more experienced fathers taking the lead. And with that, rather than trying to answer a question, again, that I can't adequately answer at this time, I decided against telling you another elephant story, and instead elected to point you to someone in the Bible who served the role of spiritual father, looking at the great things God did through the young men, uh, the young man that he spiritually fathered. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul and his relationship with a young man named Timothy. By now, most of us know quite a bit about the Apostle Paul, and some of us are also very familiar with Timothy. What we might be missing is the extent of the very special relationship between the two. Now, with that in mind, in, in 1 Timothy 1, 2, Paul refers to Timothy as my true son in the faith. In his letter to the Philippian believers, Paul writes, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. So obviously this relationship with Timothy involved more than Paul's desire to recruit a set of young legs to help carry his luggage. Paul clearly loved Timothy like a son. Where did Paul meet Timothy? Acts 16, 1 through 3 tells us that as he began his second missionary journey, Paul went first to Derby and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium, so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. In the opening chapter of 2 Timothy, one of the two letters written by Paul to Timothy after he was deployed to service in the church of Ephesus, we learn more concerning how Timothy came to faith in Jesus. In verses 3 through 5, Paul writes, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, 
And I know that same faith continues strong in you. Then in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul reminds Timothy that you have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. Well, we can't say for sure, Mama and Grandma and Timothy all likely became believers in Jesus through Paul's earlier visit to the area on his first missionary journey. What about Timothy's father? Where was he? As revealed in, in the opening verse of, of Acts 16 that we read a few moments ago, Timothy actually had an earthly father. And for all we know, Timothy's father may have been an excellent provider and mentor. However, he was a Gentile. So if he had any spiritual inclination at all, he likely worshipped made-up pagan gods. Timothy was probably no older than, than uh, late teens or early 20s when he joined Paul. Still, he had already distinguished himself as a faithful believer, and the church elders noticed him. Apparently, Paul noticed Timothy's spiritual maturity too, so he recruited him to become his understudy as he traveled on towards the Macedonian port of Troas, on to Philippi, Thessalonica, Athens, Corinth, and beyond. Paul also mentioned Timothy's presence in several New Testament letters, including 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 and 2 Thessalonians and Philemon. So Timothy went on to become a pastor in the church of Ephesus, another church founded by Paul on the same second missionary journey that eventually became the most prominent church in Asia Minor. Now who better to pastor this church than one Paul had personally mentored and considered as his spiritual son. So with that story in mind, what is, what is a spiritual father? The phrase spiritual father isn't found in the Bible. However, there's many instances in, in the New Testament where the apostles, including Paul, Love protected and led those under their care as a father would his own children, often even calling them their children. Over 2,000 years later, the idea of a spiritual father more generically refers to any Christian man who takes a godly interest in a spiritually younger believer and, and disciples them. And with that definition in mind, besides being blessed with a godly dad, over the years, I've also had many spiritual fathers. Some of them are in this room today. Hence, as we saw last week, Jesus commands his followers to make disciples, which involves creating spiritual relationships that often resemble father-son or mother-daughter relationships. And this kind of relationship is especially important for those without a godly father or mother in their lives. So, even in this late season of our lives when our children are doing well and we're ready to just sit back and be honored today, there's plenty of work still left to be done that requires the expertise of a seasoned spiritual father or mother. And I praise God again for the many that I've seen in the years that I've spent in this building who have stepped up to fill this need in someone's life. Some of us in this room have seen God use this spiritual brand of fatherhood and motherhood to take the unlikeliest of people and produce pastors and missionaries with ministries that reach across the globe to people groups who don't know a whole lot about Jesus. Therefore, as we wind this up today, I encourage our men to step up when the Holy Spirit directs and makes us aware of someone who may be struggling and is in desperate need of spiritual guidance given with the love of the Father because of the love of the Heavenly Father. In closing, as we leave here today on Father's Day Sunday for another glorious week of many to come, I implore you to do so knowing three things. First, you have a father worthy of celebration. Second, you have a role model for being a good father. And third, Having personally experienced the Heavenly Father's love, you have something important to offer to the fatherless. And with that, I'll say y'all remember to connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another, and we will see you next time.